William Shakespeare always starts his plays with something dramatic, like an explosion or soldiers running on the running onto the onto the stage or something of uh, that sort. So I've arranged with uh, my colleague uh, Paul Carley here to bring on an elephant to this. Well, where's the elephant? We haven't got it. Up my jumper. Uh, up your jumper, right? The elephant is up his jumper and he's going to release it any moment. Have I got your attention now? <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Right, um, we're going to talk today about, as you can see on the uh, board uh, up there, uh, about consonant possibilities. And thank you all for coming through this beautiful London weather <laughs> we're enjoying in order to uh, listen to this this morning. Uh, and uh, let's hope that uh, what I say is uh, worthwhile. And we're going to be looking a great deal at the handout in your course book. So if you have the handout in your course book in front of you, then you'll find uh, life is a lot easier. There will also be several complicated looking diagrams, mostly of the, uh, what we call a sagittal cross section, which is a smart name for a picture of a man, who, or maybe a woman, who appears to have had his head cut in half. Can I emphasize to you that there is no need to draw those diagrams? It would mean that you won't be able to do anything else. But you'll find all the diagrams are on Moodle, on the online uh, program that accompanies the course, and so the diagrams should be a problem for you. Let's start off with uh, our most important thing in terms uh, of constant uh, description, the thing around which it's based, which are the brief descriptive uh, labels. And you can see this uh, has the answers to three questions. Firstly, are the vocal folds buzzing? This is what we call voicing. Secondly, place of articulation. And thirdly, manner of articulation. All these things will be explained. As you can see, it says voicing is V, and place of articulation, P, manner is M, so sometimes you will hear people referring to it as VPM. So that's the abbreviation. If you see that, that's what people mean. Question in turn, well, let's start off with voicing. Are the vocal folds buzzing? Vocal folds are here inside the larynx, so in this part of your body. If you're a man, you can see this quite easily, or your larynx bobbing up and down. Uh, if you're a woman, it's a little bit more difficult, but you can always, of course, you can't feel it so easily, but if you're traveling in a London bus or on the train, something like that, lean across to the man next to you and say, excuse me, sir, may I feel your larynx? And we've, and we've had many, many very successful relationships which start in that very way. <laughs> But uh, it is, uh, it's possible to, don't you also have uh, your fingers in your ears? You can, you can feel the vocal buzz. If you say, uh, everybody, and then put your fingers in your ears. I hope you can hear me. So, <laughs> your fingers in your ears. <laughs> say Z then. <laughs> and you can probably feel, through the bones of your head, you can feel the vocal uh, folds buzzing away. That's a simple thing. Voicing is vocal folds buzzing, non-voicing, uh, voiceless is vocal folds not buzzing. In actual fact, things are a little bit more complicated than that because in some languages there are other things which apply to the two groups of voice and voices, uh, consonant sounds. We'll come to that in a minute or two. Um, it's called the fortis venus contrast, as you can see on the board. Place of articulation. That says where in the vocal tract, the vocal tract is the tube, tract is another word for tube, and it's applied to the body, the tube which is running uh, from the lungs up uh, through the mouth. So where is the sound made? Is it made, for instance, on the lips? Say a ba, a ba. Everybody? A ba. A ba. Can you see that, feel that is made at your lips? If you put your tongue behind your teeth, a ta. Then you move your tongue back, 
the center of the operation for the tongue is tongue against the teeth. If you say ah uh, ka, uh, then the ka is made with the back of your tongue uh, against uh, the soft palate, the velum uh, at the back of the mouth. So where in the mouth or in other parts of the vocal tract occasionally is the uh, sound made? Where? Then we have manner of articulation. Manner of articulation is how is the sound made? So that's the very simple basis of this, and it's always three term or sometimes two term description. Go to your handout and you will be able to see in the book there some labels, convenient consonant labels for English. Now, these are labels. They don't tell you everything about the sound. In the same way as if you see a label on the jar of raspberry jam, it has more in it than raspberries. So the label is a simplification. And in fact, one finds that there's a great deal more that you can say, but this is a convenient way of uh, talking about it. Same way as with your raspberry jam, it's easier to say, uh, could you get the raspberry jam, rather than read out all the list of ingredients and all the E numbers and all the rest of it that's on the side of the uh, dish. So a convenient way of talking about the sounds uh, then is with these short, with these brief consonant uh, labels, these short descriptions. Um, if you have a look there, you've got consonant labels uh, for English. So P, for instance, we say is fortis, which uh, is one of the, uh, one of the uh, components of fortis is uh, voiceless. So we normally use fortis and leanness for English. I'll explain why in a second. Place at the lips. Our word for at the lips is bilabial. This is taken from uh, the uh, word for lips in Latin, which is labia. Bi means two, two lips involved in the articulation, so bilabial. And the manner of articulation is a plosive. Well, you can probably feel, I'd say, ah, uh, ah, uh, everybody? Ah, uh, ah, uh, And you can probably feel there's a little explosion uh, of sound. And that's, uh, that's what we mean by plosive. Say it again. Ah, uh, pa. And you can probably feel quite easily a little uh, puff of air that comes out as you release this in the form of a minor explosion. And we have a number of ways of describing, as you can see, place of articulation. Uh, we have bilabial at the lips. Alveola. Alveolus in Latin means the gums, the tongue against the gums, just behind the teeth. Uh, vela, the tongue is back against the velum, the vela, the soft uh, palate. Do make your conversation relatively short, please. <laughs> Um, right, moving on, uh, then we'll have a look, indeed, at this fortis contrast, fortis leanest contrast in English, and try to work out what exactly it involves. Voiced and voiceless, as I said, is a phonetic distinction. It merely means, are the vocal folds buzzing? So when you have s, they're not buzzing. When you have z, they are buzzing. Fortis on the other hand, as I use it, is a phonological label. That means it refers to the sounds in certain languages and the characteristics. So it's a way of, this, of labeling uh, the sounds and the, the things involved in them in a particular language. In this case, it will be mostly our particular language will be English. And it includes several contrasting features. For instance, it has modifications that you can make to stop consonants. You should be on page two of, uh, of that handout. I think it may be page 36 in your book. Is that right, page 36? Good. Okay. Uh, and you can see there that the various things which are going to uh, take place uh, with this fortis venus contrast, modifications to stops are important. The stop consonants as we'll see later, are the ones uh, which involve some kind of explosion or some kind of stoppage in the, uh, in the mouth. And here we have... Uh, Molly, I love you, but you knew that already, didn't you? Thank you very much. Right. Uh, so aspiration, little puff of air, glottalization, uh, a little catch in the throat, 
aspiration, you can hear quite easily. A pa, okay? A pa. For English, you have this puff of air which comes uh, before the, the vowel uh, starts uh, uh, the operation. So you have this little, uh, uh, sounds almost like little H, little H like puff of air. Uh, and this is one of the modifications we can have. And then you also have glottalization. And that will require a little more explanation. Uh, this is the sound that you get. It's like a little cough sound. And you'll hear it in English in modern NRP, non-regional pronunciation. You'll hear it in English all the time. If I say, for instance, the word button, button, can you hear it there? Button. I will pronounce that T, not as a T, but as a glottal stop. And it means my vocal folds come together and then release uh, rapidly. And you'll hear this glottalization, as it's called, constantly uh, in uh, present day uh, uh, NRP. I have a feeling that we're going to get the echoes again. But still, we'll see what happens. Some other things which are different. You can see here in the Fortis Leaders contrast in that, uh, hand, in that section on the hand, on the, uh, in the course book. Fortis articulations, like P, in all respects stronger. Leanness, like B, in all respects weaker. Fortis articulation is voiceless. Leanness articulations have potential voice. They're usually voiced. In English, they're not always uh, voiced, and sometimes they're weak to be voiced. But the voice is associated with leanness and voiceless is associated with voice. Plosives, as we just mentioned, PTK, when they're initial, in a stressed syllable particularly, so therefore uh, at the beginning of uh, a syllable, often at the beginning of a word, they have strong aspiration, which is a little puff of air. It's got from the fact that the lips are held less tightly. And for the Leaner sounds, but the plosives are unaspirated. You can compare, if I say pip, pip, then you can compare that with bib, bib. In the but sound, you don't have any aspiration, but you do have voice. Then some other things, vowels are shortened before a final thought is constant. So, for instance, if I say the word beat, we have what is known John Wells invented the term, as John Wells has invented many terms. I often think that John Wells must spend every night sitting down thinking, what term shall I invent today? Uh, and his terms are usually pretty good, so they get taken up uh, by people all over the world. Um, it helps to be famous, not John Wells, of course, instead of infamous, like me. Um, but uh, <laughs> it's, uh, uh, the term which he uses is pre-fortis clipping. So, uh, clipping, shortening when it comes before a fortis consonant. Vowels, on the other hand, before a final leanest consonant, like bead, have full length. This is one of the reasons why when you talk about long and short vowels, it's not quite as simple as long and short. You have to say more about them. Try those two words then. Beat, everybody. Beat, beat. Again. Beat. With the vowel we're listening to. And now bead. Bead. Can you hear the difference? Try imitating it. Beat. 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 And in that context, that's to say, in coda position in the syllable, that's the thing which English people listen to a lot of the time to decide whether it's a, a T or D at the uh, end or any fortis or uh, venous consonant. Try it with, uh, with another type of consonant. Uh, if I say rice, think that I eat rice. 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 And compare that with rise. 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 Much more important than if I say. Uh, an S or a Z at the end. If I say rise, rise. rise. can you hear that that lengthening of the vowel gives you the Z-like uh, 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 effect? Uh, and that's the thing which uh, people, English speakers, uh, listen uh, for. Then finally, if we talk about stop consonants, uh, essentially the plosives, plus another type called Africans, we'll talk to in a second about in a second or two, the syllable final stops often have a reinforcing glottalization, a reinforcing glottal stop. So if you have bit me, 
Okay, I'm saying it. Bit me. Everybody? Hit me. Or hit me. Don't hit me, please, but nevertheless. Uh, then you may be able to hear that little glottal stop there. I can, of course, say hit me. And I can not, I might not have the glottal stop. Because often there is variance in, this, in one speaker, people will vary uh, with it. Uh, but glottalization is very important in present day uh, English if you want to sound authentically English. Maybe you don't want to sound authentically English, but <laughs> if you do, and if, even if you don't want to make this invitation, which I advise you to make, uh, then nevertheless you ought to know what's uh, going on. But we'll come back to it again. Uh, syllable final stops, uh, which are leanest, never have a vocalization. So, bid, everybody, bid, bid. compare that, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll say, uh, somebody hide it, somebody hid me. Hid me, everybody. Hid me, and compare that with hit me. Could be in some bizarre situations, I suppose, a very important distinction uh, to make. Um, right, so let's uh, move on now to consider the next uh, matter, as what is this next matter, which is place of articulation. The first thing I have to talk about there is whether the articulator, that's the the bits of the Speech mechanism, the bits of the mouth which make the sound, we term articulators. So when I talk about articulators, they're the things which make the articulation. Okay? It means uh, moving it, a, a bit which moves around, something which articulates. And here you have active and passive articulators. The active articulator is the part of the speech mechanism that moves during the articulation. The passive articulator, the part of the speech mechanism that is the target of the articulation, but remains still. Right, let's give an example. Uh, let's say, for instance, you have a T, and you say a T. Always put these sounds between vowels, by the way, because it makes them easier to hear. So it's much easier to hear a T than if I just say T. You can't hear the T, but you can hear a T quite easily. So there we are then. Ata, everybody? Ata. And now take the T out of it in your minds. Ata. Which bit is the active articulator? Yes, I heard it. Which bit of the tongue? Is it your right leg? No. Uh, is it your left ear? No. Is it your tongue? Well, why didn't you say so? <laughs> okay, it's the tongue. And to be precise, it's the tip of the tongue. And which bit of your body does the tongue hit for that articulation? Right? Let's say it again. A tongue. So where? Is it your right leg? Left leg? No? Well, we're moving up. Uh, <laughs> ear? No. Which bit is it then? Is it perhaps the just behind the teeth, the gums? Yes, okay, so there, there we are, and our smart name for just behind the teeth is, I say this, this term derives, derived from Latin, alveolus in Latin, uh, is uh, alveola. The name of the articulation is overwhelmingly uh, derived from the passive articulator. So not the bit that moves, but the target of the articulation. And that is true for virtually every articulation. In fact, we can say for, at the moment it's true for every articulation. Now, you've got here then place of articulation, and I'm going to put that up on the uh, board there. If you can't read it, don't worry, because it's also in the handout. And there you can see some English places of articulation. So first of all, we have bilabial. We've talked about that already. So in a ba, for instance, a pa, and the other examples there, a ma, a wa. Labiodental. Labio is uh, 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 from uh, Latin labia, means teeth. Uh, dental, uh, uh, I mean lips, I'm sorry, thank you for the correction. Uh, uh, dental means uh, teeth. Lip to teeth. So this gives us a ba, everybody. Ah, ba, ah, ba. Ah, ba. So this little biting uh, action that you make for ba and ba. 
Denko is tongue tip towards the teeth. And this gives us these uh, the fearful, the dreaded sounds in English. They're not really all that dreadful because they're quite easy to make. I'm sure we can all make them now. Atha. Atha. And that's dental tip of the tongue between uh, the teeth. Now then we have alveolar. Well, I've explained those already. And one of the reasons I use this as, as the explanation is that so many sounds are indeed in English alveolar. And uh, English is a kind of uh, alveolar language. It has what we sometimes call alveolar uh, setting. So, ata, ada, asa, can't hear you shout it out, asa, ana, ala, ara. R is a, is a funny old sound because officially it is post alveolar. By post we mean that it's a little bit further back than alveolar, but in, in fact even though we draw diagrams of it in that way, and it can be said that way, uh, often we find uh, that it's said rather uh, differently. So uh, we'll, we'll come back to R, English R, uh, later again. I could give the whole lecture on English R and probably several other lectures uh, as well. Um, but you'll find that even though it's difficult to describe, if you know how to make it, it's surprisingly easy to make. Um, right, uh, moving on then, we have palato alveolar, derived from number six there, the uh, palate, and so between the palate and the alveolar ridge, and a big chunk of the tongue goes up to make these sounds. Asha, Aja, Acha, and Aja. Okay, then palatal itself, just one sound in English, the tongue moving towards the hard palate at the uh, top of your mouth. Um, if you don't mind uh, a lack of hygiene, you can go and <laughs> I hope you understood what I said. Uh, you can feel your hard palate uh, quite, uh, quite easily. And so this is ya, everybody, ah, ya. And that's the palatal sound with the tongue coming up towards the hard palate. Eventually, the uh, hard palate turns into the soft palate, or vena. Once again, if you put your finger in your mouth, you're like, <laughs> I often have people uh, being sick all over the, uh, all over the, the hole at this place, uh, because you have a reflex, which, which means, so you have to be a little bit careful about being too exploratory with putting your finger in your mouth as well, so that's concerned. Um, but um, in any case, that gives you sounds, uh, significant sounds in English. For example, a uh, ka, Aga, uh, one we haven't put down here, I don't know why, probably just a mistake. Anga, uh, which is the Vila version. And then you also have Awa. Uh, so uh, W is made with the back of the tongue and simultaneously with uh, your lips uh, rounded. So this, we call that uh, a labial Vila uh, consonant. And then finally, uh, we have in the vocal folds, in the center it's vocal folds, we have aha, everybody. Again, the funny old sound, aha, uh, as they say in South Wales, uh, uh, because it's something more like a voiceless vowel, but we'll come to it later. And then our friend, the glottal stop, ah, uh, ah, uh, everybody. Ah, uh, ah, uh, that's right, it's sort of like, uh, like sounds. If you're lifting a heavy weight, try saying it. Uh, ah, everybody. Sometimes helps to raise your raise your hands. Don't do that. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh, that's it. <laughs> Nothing like morning exercise, is there? <laughs> okay. Um, we have some uh, other places of articulation which aren't found in uh, uh, English. Um, so we can say, uh, for instance, um, I think this is on your um, on your hand on your hand. Uh, uh, you can you, you can you can say that uh, um, you can have sounds made, for instance, at the uh, uvula. Uh, so you can have sounds like arra with your tongue with the uh, with the uh, uh, with, with the uh, uvula rolling against the back of the uh, tongue. 
uh, and pharyngeal sounds. And if you speak Indian languages, for instance, you'll have sounds made with the with the tongue curled back. Arka, arga, arna. Well, uh, Michael is going to give you a great performance of all these sounds at the uh, end of the course, and he'll do them very much better than I could do them. So I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to do all these uh, these examples uh, for you uh, here. Um, we can detail places of articulation uh, by putting pre if we want to move sounds further forward. We can say the tongue is further forward than the, uh, than the, the normal uh, position. Post if we want to move it backwards. Some people, for instance, call our post alveolar these days. Um, I don't think that most of the tutors on this course will be using that. Uh, uh, will be using, um, sorry, they will be using uh, uh, that term. Uh, but uh, other people use post alveolar for sh and j and ch and j. And um, I shan't use that. I, I'll use the traditional term palato alveolar. And I think most tutors here will, uh, will do that. But to move on now then to manner of articulation. Manner of articulation depends on a concept uh, which is stricture. And that means how the tongue is, or any other part of the body making the articulator, how close it is be, uh, to the uh, passive articulator. So we can talk in terms of close stricture versus uh, narrow stricture. Let me explain it in another way. Uh, how many people here have gardens in their houses, or when you were children, uh, did you have a garden in your house? Those who had a garden in their house, put your hand up. Those who had a father who made you work in the garden, put your hand up. <laughs> did you ever have to water the plants? Did you have uh, a long pipe with water attached to a tap and you had to help your father water the plants? Did you ever do what I sometimes did? I wouldn't, tell, I wouldn't have told my father this, but as the water comes out and it's coming through the tube, blah, 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 through the tube to the end, and what you do is step on it. <laughs> Daddy goes down, look at it, you release it, <laughs> and it gets covered, it gets covered in water, at which point, uh, if you're sensible, you, know, you move yourself upstairs at the highest possible speed. Um, well, that's a, that's a way of thinking of stricture, because we're, we're not dealing with a garden hose by but we're, we're dealing with the vocal tract, we're dealing with the tube uh, in, the, uh, in the mouth. Uh, but what you're doing is making the same kind of stricture with air instead of water. So you're closing it up and uh, releasing it. How much the closure is, in other words, how much you step on the pipe, this depend, This is the way in which we uh, classify the, uh, the types of articulation. Let's have a look. We can see the deal here, you see, between close stricture, open stricture. Notice it's stricture and not structure. So it's a stricture, something which compresses uh, a tube. Right, let's see. It can be complete closure. So we're not structure which blocks the airstream totally. All sounds made with an air coming from the lungs, we call that a, an airstream. It can be a narrow, <coughs> that's to say, you have a narrow passageway which produces friction. Friction is, the friction quite easily, remember your lessons in school. Friction in this case is the air passing through the uh, relatively uh, narrow stretch. Now, or we can have approximation. This changes the shape of the vocal tract and it changes uh, the nature of the resonance. Um, all the vowels are approximants. We don't usually refer to them as that, for approximants. We also have consonant, <coughs> consonant sounds which are vowel-like and we use those uh, for approximants. So, for instance, r is a good example, w is a good example of uh, vowel-like approximants which behave uh, as if they're consonants in the uh, structure of the language. Now, uh, here you have an example of uh, complete closure, which is plosive uh, T. Try to say, ah, ta. And now think of it in terms of 
how is that sound made? The air passes from the lungs, you have a complete closure uh, behind the gums at the alveolar the ridge, and so therefore uh, you have what we call uh, a plosive. You have the, at the release of the tongue, you have uh, the little, the little uh, uh, air uh, coming, coming out, and with the T sound you actually hear the puff of air as well, which is the aspiration. But if we had D, uh, da, everybody, uh, da, repeat them after me each time, uh, da, feel that it has your saying it, uh, da, everybody, and you can feel there, I think, the way in which the positive sound is made. We could also have a complete closure, but a relatively slow release, relatively slow, means, in this case, that you're dealing in fractions of a second. But this is acha, everybody. Instead of releasing it quickly, it's slowly and it has friction. Well, this is what the diagram looks like. Your tongue just moves down a little bit to give you uh, friction with it. Say it again, acha. Now, remember the diagrams will be on Moodle, so you don't need to draw the diagrams. There we have uh, nasal. In this case, the soft palate uh, is lowered, and so the sound is, comes out through the nose. Amma, everybody. Amma. Keep nasal sounds going. Uh, they don't have any, uh, any closure or anything, so you don't have a build-up of air or, or, or closure of any sort. You can keep it going. Say, mmm, everybody. And if you want to prove that, you can, that it is through the nose, mmm, and pinch your nose, mmm. And if you don't have the sound coming out through your nose, you can't make the sound. So those are nasal sounds like na, na. Here we have a fricative sound. So here you have s and a s, and you can probably hear the friction. You all sound like snakes at the moment, uh, making this uh, friction for the uh, na uh, uh, sound there. This is a type of approximant, it's a lateral approximant. Lateral approximants, la, everybody, la. the essential thing is the sides of the tongue are lowered. So the sides of the tongue are lowered, and you can see that here, because this is a front view taken from the front, and you can see for L, the sides of the tongue are lowered, they're raised for D. So uh, uh, compare la and da. For D, the sides of the tongue are raised. Try breathing in uh, when you say Allah, everybody. Allah. Now breathe in, Allah. And you should feel cold air coming over the sides of the, uh, of the tongue. And here you have the approximant R, and I've put into a, in a phonetic symbol to indicate that this is English. It's not like the R in a lot of languages. It's not a R sound with a tongue trilling uh, against the uh, teeth ridge. It's just pointing towards it. And I'll tell you a little secret. You don't need to have the tongue going R, 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 up like that. You can make it quite efficiently by raising the sides of your tongue. So try saying it now. Ara, everybody. Ara. Compare ala. Sides lowered and ara, sides raised. And that's one of the most important things in making the contrast between those uh, two sounds. You have another thing which is lip rounding. We will come to that in a second. This is uh, a diagram which gives you the summary and a way in which we can use a few more technical terms for classifying uh, consonant sounds. So consonants we can divide into obstruents and sonorants. Obstruents means that there is some blockage or some narrowing uh, somewhere. Sonorants means that you have sounds which are vowel-like, essentially. Obstruents can be divided into stops and fricatives. When you have the stops, you can make a further division 
into the plosives, but, but, uh, the kerga, for instance, and the affricates. These are the ones with the slow release, acha, acha. The fricatives are there, so fa, va, 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 etc. And there you have the complete set of obstruct sounds. On the sonorant side, you have firstly the nasals. These are vowel-like in some ways. Uh, they can uh, they can be uh, continuous. They're also to a certain extent like the obstruents, in as much as there is uh, a stoppage uh, in the uh, in in the mouth. But we usually class them in with the sonorant category. Then you have approximants, uh, and uh, for the approximants you have lateral uh, and central approximants. Besides the tongue lower, as for L, these are lateral approximants. Uh, if it's uh, central, non, no, no lowering of the sides of the tongue, then this gives you uh, sounds like W, Y, and R, uh, and these uh, are the uh, central <coughs> approximant uh, sounds. So here you have what we call cover terms, taking in uh, several groups. A stop is, covers plosives and affricates. Obstruent covers stops and fricatives. Sonorant, best idea is to think of it as the remaining sound types, which have characteristics in common with vowels. Now, uh, we can also have some characteristics of sounds in this way, where you can talk about the relationship to voice. Sonorants, that's to say, nasals and approximants, are voiced throughout. So the vocal folds will be, will be buzzing all the time. Uh, fortis a stop, uh, obstruents, stops and fricatives, are voiceless throughout. But you also have the question of voicing in context. Leanest obstruents, they're fully voiced when they're into the cavity. So you can compare, for instance, big, where I can have some de-voicing in the final, uh, the, the initial B and the final G, as compared with bigger. And the G in the middle there will have voicing uh, throughout. So when it's intervocalic, and that just means between vowels, you have a uh, full voice. Try saying those two. Big. 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 I can say it's almost big. Almost no voice at all uh, in that final gut sound. But if I say bigger, then the voice will go all the way through. So that these, uh, and you hear it uh, in the obstruents, they are partially devoiced when syllable initial, that's to say in the onset, and often even fully devoiced when they're syllable uh, final. We do it especially with fricative sounds uh, in English, and I gave you the example earlier, um, rice. No voicing, why not? Because it's fortis or lemus. The S at the end is fortis, so you don't have any voicing. But if I say rise, rise, then you have a Z at the end, so you'd expect it to be voiced, rise. But that isn't what you hear. In actual fact, it's just the articulation is weaker. It tends not to be strongly voiced. How do you tell the difference? It's the length of the preceding vowel. So you can see, and your tutors will tell you more about this undoubtedly, the difference between fortis and lenis sounds in English is, um, is a pretty crucial thing. Now, we're coming up now to the, uh, towards the end of my talk, but there's an important uh, extra thing to say, and that is that sounds can have secondary articulations. These are all characterized by isations in the label. So we have labialization, palatalization, and velarization. Look at your handout if you want a little bit more detail than uh, what's, on the, uh, what's on the slide. Um, if, you look at the, uh, if you look at the hand out there, there's a table right at the bottom, and it will tell you that labialization is the addition of lip rounding, but it also gives some examples and a way of symbolizing it. So if you have a T before or, for instance, this is likely to have lip rounding 
uh, attached because the or, the following or, has lip rounding, and we show that with a little raised w, w after the uh, after the t. Uh, so this gives us talk. These are phonetic symbolizations, of course. They're giving us extra information about allophones. Palatalization, addition of front tongue raising. That's y like. And this you will hear in the traditional pronunciation of the word tune, everybody. <laughs> People cheat these days, and they, you can cheat as well. If you find tune with this uh, palatalization difficult to say, then you can just say it the way I say it, the way Paul says it, I would imagine. Tell me, no, no, you may not, kind of thing. But the way, the way uh, uh, many uh, English people, and particularly younger people, much younger than I say, we just say tune. In fact, we turn it into a ch sound. Uh, velarization is the addition of the back of the tongue uh, uh, rise, uh, uh, raise, uh, back of tongue raising towards the velum. So the back of tongue uh, rises towards the velum. That we show with a uh, little wavy line. If you look at your handout uh, through the symbol, and that gives us uh, that gives us the uh, dark L for English. Uh, for instance. So if you say still, everybody, still. and you pronounce it uh, as English people do, then you'll have uh, velarization on that L. That's what dark means in this context. Whereas if you say it, for instance, as French people may pronounce it, or in the English of uh, uh, South Wales, uh, for instance, where you have clear L all, all the time, then that would be still, everybody, still, uh, not uh, not the way it's said normally in English, and that mm. sound uh, is with palatalization. Yeah. So you have these secondary uh, articulations, and here, and this is, I think, on your uh, handout as well. Yes, uh, above that, on the handout, you have where those secondary uh, articulations uh, are made. Right, what have we uh, talked about uh, today then? concludes our discussion of consonant possibilities, and of course we've been discussing such possible... I haven't quite finished yet, so... <laughs> we've been discussing these possibilities in relation to English. If we had taken into account all the languages of the world, uh, then you find there's a great deal extra to say about them, uh, uh, particularly in terms of manner of articulation. But I'm not going to concern myself with this at the moment, it's coming up to uh, uh, time to uh, stop the lecture. And later in the course, Michael is going to, as I said, on the last Friday of the course, he's going to take you for a language tour all around the world. Uh, and so you'll be able to hear all these sounds and all their glory. And in the meantime, I'm going to be, you haven't got rid of me yet. I'm going to be coming back for my return visit on Monday. We're going to see then how they function in present-day uh, RP, I usually call it NRP, so non-regional pronunciation, uh, and we'll go right the way through the consonant system and see what we can say about sounds in modern, up-to-date uh, uh, English. So, uh, see you all on Monday.